Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse uh, 42. And it reads like this. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. It says, then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. It says, now all who believed were together, had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, divided them among all as anyone had need. Verse 46 says, so da continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So as we dive into this Acts series, I want to talk to you on the subject of continuing in the journey, continuing in the journey. Before you see this, shake your neighbor's hand, tell him God bless you, and you can be seated this morning. Continuing in the journey. Look over at your neighbor and ask him this morning, are you in? Now, you might be here this morning and ask this question, Pastor, why are you not saying on the journey? Why are you not preaching about continuing on the journey? Well, when we read chapter 2 and what we read, you kind of see that the word in is mentioned four different times. And just the, the short portion of scripture we read, the word in is mentioned a number of times. And when I think about this message today, I, I really like the word in because to me it's a lot deeper than the word on. And I, and I think that's the goal. Think that God doesn't want us to be on something. He wants us to be in something. The story of the book of Acts is all about in. Someone say in. Because it's here in the book of Acts chapter 2 where we find that the people were filled with the Holy Spirit. They went from being on the outside of a move of God. Have you ever been on the outside of anything? There's an oldie that used to be sung. I'm on the outside looking in. And I don't want to be on the outside. I want to be on the inside. And the Bible tells us that these people, when they were filled with the spirit, they went from being on the outside of the move of God's spirit to being on the inside of a move of God's spirit, which is the church. And I want to tell you, you are sitting not just in a church, you are sitting in a move of God. I'll say it again. You're not just sitting in a church. You are sitting in a move of God. And I think there's some people here this morning that need to understand that you're not just supposed to linger on the outside. God wants you to come inside. Now, I know there's many songs that we sing in the church, even here in our church. Many songs we sing, and the general idea is that the Holy Spirit falls on us. How many heard those songs we sing? You know, Holy Spirit, rain on me, and Spirit, fall down, and we believe that the Spirit falls on, you know, when we're singing those songs. But in reality, the believers in the upper room, the Spirit did not fall in them, on them, but it began to fill them. They were filled with the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God went from being on them and being around them to being inside of them. In the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. So we see that they were filled with the Spirit. Is there anyone here this morning that you say, I am filled, Pastor. I am filled with the Spirit of God. Less in this service than in the first service, but at least we got some people filled. Let me ask you one more time. How many are say, I'm filled. I have the Holy Spirit. I have the Holy Ghost. See, they were filled, and then they started to do things. They were filled, then they started to do things. They were, they, they, they were different now. And how many know that when the Spirit fills you, you're different? See, when the Spirit fills you, you're different. But the difference is this. It's not a difference from the outside in. There's some people that think, you know, change is from the outside in. You could have a new suit. You could, you could have better clothes. You could have some nice hair dye or whatever you got on the outside. Can I hear an amen? But when the Spirit fills you, it's not an outside-in job. It's an inside-out job. 
See, man looks at the outer appearance. And you might look good on the outside this morning, drove up in a nice vehicle this morning, got your best dress on and, you know, your best wig on this morning. But I came to tell you, God's not looking at what's happening on the outside. God is looking for somebody that is experiencing a move of the spirit on the inside. And I wonder if there's anyone here this morning that could say, I've been filled by the spirit of God and I'm not the man I used to be. I'm not the person I used to be. Can you shout to the Lord with victory because the change is on the inside out? See, when the spirit fell on them, everything changed. Change neighbor, everything changed. They went from being shy lambs to bold lions. Some of us, before we came to God, we were shy lambs. We couldn't speak. But when the spirit filled you, you became bold as a lion. They went from being fearful followers to faith-filled disciples. Fearful followers. There was a time when they were afraid because of the events of Calvary. They were afraid because of the events of the cross. They went into hiding. But when the spirit fell upon them, they went from being fearful followers to being faith-filled disciples. In other words, they went from an I can't mentality. I can't do anything great. I can't be anything great to an I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Because when the spirit begins to fill you, how many know it makes the entire difference? They went from obscurity to influence. They went from being, who are these men? They went from, who are these men? Or who do they think they are? They went from, who are these men? To, these are the men who turned the city upside down. So you're understanding me this morning that when the spirit fills you, everything begins to change. When the spirit fills you, there's a powerful shift in your life. What am I trying to say to you this morning? Listen, God hasn't called you to live on the surface of Christianity. He doesn't want you to be on the journey. He wants you to be in the journey because there's power in the journey. Oh, come on, somebody. Notice that when the spirit filled them, it was not just for a one time event. The Bible tells us here four times in this portion of scripture that they continued in. Look at your neighbor and tell them, you've got to continue in. In other words, the spirit didn't fill them and then leave them. The spirit did not abandon them. The spirit filled them once and for all. The Holy Spirit did not leave them. They were not just empowered for a moment. But the Bible says they kept the power because they continued in the spirit. And they continued in the spirit. Why did they continue in the spirit? I'll tell you why. Because the spirit of God is a moving spirit. The spirit of God is not a stagnant, stay in the same place spirit. But the spirit of God is a moving spirit. Tell your neighbor, it's a moving spirit. See, that's why every single one of us, if we're going to be on the journey, we need to continue not on the journey. We need to continue in the journey. Because God's spirit is a moving spirit. And if we are going to continue, we've got to move with what the spirit of God is doing in your church. Now, I want to talk to some of you who say this is my church. If you say this is my church, I want you to shout or make yourself known. That's good. Then, then if you're going to continue in, you got to continue in with what God is doing in your church. If you are here today and you are satisfied with where you are on this journey, then I, I venture to tell you this message is not for you. This message will be a waste of your time. It will just fill an hour and a half of your life. But if you are a Christian who recognizes that we're not there yet... If you're a Christian this morning that recognizes that God has done some great things in the past and God might even be doing some great things in the present, but we're not there yet because God still wants to do some great things in the future, then this message is just for you. This message is not for those who have become satisfied. This message is not for those who are spiritually dead unless you let the spirit of God begin to fill you this morning. This message is for people who recognize that to continue in the journey, you have to understand there's a purpose and I have a certain determination that I may not be what I want to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be and I'm on my way to where God wants me to be and I'm not going to go by my Myself. I'm taking people with me. I'm taking my marriage with me. I'm taking my kids with me. This message is for you. 
See, this is so important to bring out this morning when you talk about the book of Acts and you talk about continuing in the journey. Because the question is to maybe even some of us older believers, some of you have been serving God a little while, some of you that have experienced ministry, the question is, how do you continue year after year? What keeps you coming back to this place? How do you keep going forward in the things of God? How do you continue, watch this, without burning out? So many Christians today are talking about burnout and I'm tired and everybody wants to be used until they're being used. But you're the one that made the altar call, not me. How do you continue week in, week out, month in, year in, year out? How do you not burn out? How do you keep going forward without crashing in the wall? How do you continue to journey with joy? Because the reality is there's some people that come to church and you have no joy. You can't sing. You can't shout. Preacher's preaching his heart out. Can't say amen. No longer take notes. Come on, somebody. How do you stand the will of God for your life? How do you stay enthusiastic in a spirit of revival? How do you stay focused when the world's trying to pull you out of God's will? How do you stay unswerving in your faith? See, this message is for somebody here today that says, I'm not on the journey. I'm in the journey. I'm not on the journey. I'm in the journey. And I want to tell you about myself is, is I don't want to just start this journey. I've been serving the Lord a little while now, 25 years. But I want to tell you, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting started. I've been serving God a little while, and I, I want to tell you, I've had a pretty good start. I've done some things. I've experienced some good things in my life. But when it's all said and done, I don't want to stumble across the finish line in a thousand pieces. When that finish line comes, I don't want to be dragging my leg. Come on, somebody. I want to be moving in a fervent spirit. I want to be moving in a spirit of revival. I want to finish stronger than I started. My start has been pretty strong, so I got a long way to go. I don't want to be dying at the finish line. I want to tell you, I don't want to finish bitter. So many Christians, they finish bitter, unresolved issues in their heart. I don't want to finish angry. I don't want to be the angry preacher when I'm 65 years old. I want to be on fire at 65 with the same fire that I had. See, you got to begin to think about these things because I tell you, my friend, we've got a journey to continue to travel. I want to be able to hear those words from the Lord where he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. And then I want to look at the Lord and say, Lord, I did everything you called me to be. I did everything you called me to do. I left nothing unfinished. I left nothing undone. You see, we need a generation of people here today that are going to say, I'm not just on this journey. I'm in this journey. Ask your neighbor, are you in the journey? Now, there are three things that the church did to continue in the journey. To continue in the journey. The first thing is this, is that the people, they, they, they fed those people who they found. How many of you here today say at one time you were lost, but now you're found? Now you're found. In, in Acts 2.42, let's look at it. It says, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. They, they, they continued in the apostles' doctrine. Another word for doctrine is the word teaching. They were steadfast in and continually sat under the teaching of their leaders. They continually sat under the preaching and the impartation of their spiritual leaders. They kept themselves fed with the word of God. Now, how many of you say, I want to stay in the journey? Then you must understand the value of keeping yourself fed in the word of God. Now, in those times, they didn't have the Bible. They didn't have a Bible like we have today, but what they had were the teachings of Christ that the apostles stored up in their heart as they sat under Jesus for three and a half years, and they would come together and discuss the teachings and the miracles and the great deeds that Jesus did when he was here on this earth. And the Bible says this, that daily they gathered to hear the stories. Say that word with me, say daily. daily. I think the, the big challenge and why the churches don't grow today is because we, in those days, early church, they, they gathered daily, but now 
Most people only come to church on Sunday. And I want to tell you, if you want to stay on the journey, you, you, you got to recognize that church is not just on Sunday. Church is every day. Church is every day. The Bible says they gather daily. Daily they gather to hear the stories. Daily they gather to sit under the teaching of the apostles. Daily they gather to receive the keys to the kingdom life. See, Jesus told Peter, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. Come on, somebody. How many of you got some keys in your pockets? You got some car keys in your pocket. But my question is, do you have the keys to the kingdom in your pocket? See, when you get under the teaching, you're getting the keys to the kingdom. Daily, they gathered to receive the keys to the kingdom. And notice, they didn't come with a religious attitude. They didn't come with a seeker's mentality. Well, let me see if I like it. See, when, 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 when Jesus looked at Peter, he says, are you going to leave me too? Are you going to rank out too? Peter said, where am I going to go? Peter said, where am I going to go? You hold the keys to eternal life. You have the keys of the kingdom. I have no, what am I going to do? Go back to chaos? Go, go back to pain? Go back to hurt? Go back to stupidity? See, when they came to be fed, <laughs> how many of you came to be fed this morning? When they came to be fed, they didn't come with an exploratory spirit. They came with a maintained appetite. They came with an appetite. They came with a hunger. They came with a desire for God's word. Their mentality was, I can't get enough of what I'm learning. I can't get enough of what's being poured into my life. I I've just got to get under the, the spout where the glory comes out. I've just got to get under the wisdom. I just got to get under the understanding. I just got to get under this word because something's happening to me. Watch this. Not on the outside. Something's happening on the inside. Something's shifting on the inside. Something's changing on the inside. They couldn't get enough of the word of God. They couldn't get enough of what they were learning and experiencing because for the first time in their life, they began to realize that growth came through the word of God. That as the word of God was being preached, they begin to grow. In Romans 10, 17, the Bible says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Another scripture says, how will they know without a preacher? Woo. How many of you say, I need a preacher. I need the word. See, where the word was being preached, we find that faith was exploding. As they gathered together to feed and to eat the word. Faith was exploding. And here's what I've learned, and here's what the Bible teaches, is that where faith is exploding, miracles are being released. Okay? So the word is preached. Faith explodes. Miracles are released. Some of you say, I don't believe in miracles. Well, you should. Because the Bible itself says where the word of God is preached, signs and wonders must follow. And I want to tell you, we live in a day where signs, are not, signs and wonders are not dead. Signs and wonders are still alive. Miracles are still alive. Healing is still possible. I don't care if you have cancer in your body. I don't care if your liver is shriveling. I don't care if the doctor said there's no hope. I came to tell you we serve a God that can heal. We serve a God of miracles. We serve a God that still delivers. But you've got to get under the word. Tell your neighbors, stay fed. See, where do we see the power of God manifest? Right on over in Acts chapter 3. In Acts chapter 3, you know the story of the, bame, of the lame beggar. There was a man who was lame. He, they would lay him every day at the gate called Beautiful, right outside the church doors. And as Peter and, and, and John were going to, to the temple for the hour of prayer, they encountered the lame man who they'd seen many, many times before, but something was different this time. They had something on the inside that they didn't have before. And as people walked past this man, Time and again, as he begged for alms, nobody could help him. Nobody could pull him out of that condition. No one could change his situation. But they encountered two men who were continuing in the journey. Two men who were continuing in the move of God. Two men who were sitting under the word. Two men who had a strong faith. They looked over at that lame beggar and they said, silver and gold have we not. But we have something. <laughs> We've been filled with the Spirit. 
We've been filled with the power. We've been filled with the presence of God. And we may not have money, but what we have, we give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And immediately strength came into his legs. The Bible says he leaped. Come on, somebody. He jumped. He began to run. He began to rejoice. And here's what I want to say. That's what happened to you and I. When we sat under the word and we were filled with the spirit, we were no longer lame. We were no longer stuck. We were no longer lost. But we didn't we jump and didn't we didn't we leap? And you know what the great news is? For those of you that are continuing in the journey, you still got something more to give. Now you can take everything you have and you can pour it into somebody else. So you've got to continue in the journey. But to continue in the journey, my friend, I want to tell you this. You've got to take, you've got to take a serious evaluation of your hunger. You, 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 got, to, you got to stay hungry. You, you got to stay teachable. You've got to stay open. Uh, don't, don't get to the place where you know it all. Because if you know it all, then you teach me, man. You show me. If you know it all, then let me see some miracles following you. But if I don't see no miracles, that means you ain't there yet. You got to stay hungry. Can I hear an amen? You got to stay in the journey. You got to continue in the journey. You got to stay in it. So the first thing we see is that they fed those who were found. The second thing we can learn here is that they also focused those who were faithful. They, were fo they focused those who were faithful. In the book of Acts chapter 2, it says, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in the breaking of bread. In the breaking of bread. Verse 46 says this, so continually daily in one accord in the temple, once again, and breaking bread. How many know Christians love to eat? This is where all started, guys. Denny's. This is where Denny's was created. <laughs> Breaking bread from house to house. From house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. So what we find is not only were they feeding those who got found, but then they focused themselves and they focused those who are being faithful to the house of the Lord. Now, there was a way that they remain focused. Someone say focus. Because to continue in this journey, you've got to stay focused. And the way they remain focused, the Bible tells us, was through fellowship. Through fellowship. Here's what I want to say to you, is that if you want to move from being on the journey to being in and continuing in the journey, you must get into fellowship. You must be in fellowship. If you want to continue in, you can't be a Lone Ranger. And I'm going to tell you, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto. She was never truly alone. You, you need the fellowship. You see, for a moment, I want to teach you the difference between those who are on the journey and those who are in the journey because the struggle today is because of the church's belief in the supernatural we believe in the supernatural we believe in miracle power but many who come to church they're only looking for the quick fix of a miracle it's very true and those that are looking for the quick fix of a miracle those are the people who aren't continuing in the journey. Those are ones who are on the journey. But they're on the journey only based on whether they get their miracle or not. They say, I'll stay on the journey, Pastor, as long as God gives me my miracle. I'll stay on the journey as long as God gets my hu husband right with you. Come on, somebody. I'll stay on the journey as long as I get what God needs. And when the way they look at God is like a genie, they, they rub the lamp three times and the genie comes out and does whatever they need. And, and, and that's the problem with the church today is that there's too many people that they have a conditional commitment. Sometimes they're more focused on what God can do for them 
instead of what God wants to do in them. And it's not about what God wants to do for them. It's about what God wants to do in them so that God can actually move through them. That's why to continue in the journey, you've got to respect the process. You, you've got to respect the process. The, the early church was powerful because the Bible says they, they continued in. And it were powerful because they were committed to the process of development in their life. Now, let me tell you something about those who want to continue in. Whenever God wants to grow you, he always includes people. <laughs> he always includes people. Proverbs 27, verse 17 brings the principle out. It says, as iron sharpens iron. So a person sharpens another person. So what does God do to make us into powerful, useful vessels in the house of God is that God will take people and bring them into your life. And God will bring people and he will bring them in to begin to shape you. If, 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 the, if the Proverbs 27 principle is true, then understand that in order for a hard substance to be sharpened, it, mu it must be struck against an equally or more hard substance. In other words, what I'm trying to tell you is you cannot sharpen a knife with a feather. <laughs> you cannot sharpen a knife with a feather. How many of you say, I want to continue in the journey? How many say, I want to make it to the finish line? How many say, I want to get everything that God has for my life and for my family? Then understand me that you can't sharpen a knife with a feather. And that's the problem with this generation. That's the problem with this generation. I, yeah, is it a problem? Yes, it's a problem. It's not a challenge. It's a problem. Because we live in a day where people are afraid of real life connection. We live in the social media era. And let me tell you something. Social media is not real. If you haven't figured that out yet, you're not that popular, my friend. It's not real. Can I hear an amen? It's not true connection. Social media has dumbed down godly connection. And we're in a generation of people that you live for likes. You live for hearts. You live for emojis. And if you don't get it, you drop it. And if you don't get it, you block. Can I hear an amen? And social media has created a climate for comfort and agreement. But if you want to grow and you want to continue in the journey and if you want to allow, uh, you want to make it to the place that God has called you to go to, then you can't just get down with agreement. You got to allow God to put people in your life that are actually going to disagree with you from time to time. That's not popular preaching. Oh, pastor, agree with me in prayer. Agree with me in blessing. Agree with me with salvation for my family. Agree with me for my dream to come to pass. Agree with me for my ministry to be fulfilled. Agree, 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 agree. But we've been agreeing with you and you're not growing. So God wants to bring some people in that are going to disagree. You can be sharpened for his glory and his honor. See, some of you are not liking it, but that's all right. I want to talk to people who want to make it in the journey, want to make it in the church, want to make it to the finish line. I thank God not only for the people that can agree with me, but I thank God that he's placed some people in my life that from time to time will disagree with me. The Bible says they broke bread from house to house. The Bible says that they hung out together. The Bible says that they did not shy away from one another, hang out in their bedroom all alone, looking at the stupid phone. Can I hear an amen? They fellowship. They sharpened each other. They encouraged each other. They prayed for one another. And I'm going to tell you, I would have never got where I was today being sharpened by feathers. I got to tell you, man, you, you see me stand up here in this high place. Let me tell you, man, there are people that I am accountable to. I've got some people in my life. 
How about you? I've got some people in my life that don't think I'm all that great. I've got some people in my life that aren't so impressed by my preaching ability. They're not so impressed with my dressing style. They don't care what kind of car I drive or who I'm married to. They're not impressed by my church. I've got some sharp pieces of steel that are not impressed by me. And from time to time, they will tell me what I need to hear. And that's why I am the man I am today. I've got pastors in my life. I got people that preach in my life. I got people that speak to me. Oh, and if you want to be everything God has called you to be, you got to come into fellowship. Man, this is good preaching right here. That's why, listen, if you only come to church on Sunday morning, you're not in the journey, you're on the journey. This is your week where you get in. You know, I want to tell you, we, we have ministries here that are designed to grow you and to build you. You know, one of those ministries is the men's home. <laughs> and you say, oh, my God, Pastor, you're going to throw me in the men's home? No, I'm not. I know you can't go to the home. But, you know, you brothers, if you stay in the home, you'll grow. But if you leave the home, you'll die. But if you stay in the home and you continue in the journey, you'll grow three times faster than the people in this church. You'll be stronger in the long run. You'll be like Howard Pittman. You'll be like Charles Stansill. You'll be like some of the men that have been in our homes and they're still serving. If you graduated the home, I want you to stand. I want you to give God some praise in this place. They're still in the journey. They're still in the house of the Lord. I thank God for our discipleship homes. Whew. If you're in the discipleship home, you're going to grow. You're in fellowship all the way. And you know what I hope happens this week? I hope someone gets in your face. I hope someone just, God uses to come and cut a rough edge off of your life. I hope God sends your messenger. Some of you are like, ooh, pastor, what are you cursing me? I ain't cursing you, brother. I'm blessing you. Because God's got a big plan for your life. And God's going to raise you up. And you're going to be a world shaker. You're going to be a history maker. Let God do what he wants to do. Let him use his people to sharpen you. What about our city life groups? Woo. How many of you love your city life group? I want to ask a question. How many of you are either in women's Bible, men of valor, or a city life group? I want you to stand right now. Woo. Wow. Wow. Some of you are not standing, and I'm concerned, because the Bible says you could be seated. Some of you are looking around like, I'm going to grab this one and bring in my group. <laughs> Good. I want you to do that. The Bible says they broke bread from house to house. They were not just together on Sunday. They were together every day. They were in fellowship. And when you're in fellowship, that's when you begin to grow. That's why I really believe that we need every single person in this church, not just to come on Sunday, but to get involved with a group of people in the church. And when you come into that group, man, come in ready to grow. Come in, come in ready to be encouraged. Come in ready to be built up in the word. Yes, there's times of disagreement, but there's a whole lot of time for agreement as well. Recognize that when you come into the journey and you begin to plug in, that's when you're going to be everything God's called you to be. How many believe it? Can you give God a big praise? I'm almost done. And then the final point is this. In this story, 
is not only those who are fed, those who are found fed. <laughs> it's a little tricky. And then they focus those who are faithful. But lastly and finally, as Matthew comes, the lost were found and the faithful were kept. The lost were found. The Bible says here, after all these things, in the final line, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. And what was happening in the early church, and what I believe is happening here, this is, this is happening right now. I could feel it. Is that when they recognized that God had filled them, and they were growing in the word, and they were fellowshipping with one another, and they were growing in their character, they began to take what they had and begin to use it for the glory of God. Wherever they went, they begin to share what the Lord had placed inside of them. And the Bible says that they had great effect, great results came. That people were being saved and the church was growing. Now, let me tell you something that not only does God want us to find those who are lost, but this is so key. He also wants us to keep those who are found and faithful. The Bible says the church grew. And a church doesn't grow, watch this, just by reaching the lost. The church can only grow when you reach what's lost and keep what's found. It doesn't say that 10 came in and 10 left. It doesn't say three backslid and six got saved. It doesn't say that, you know, 10 people got hurt and 10 people came in. See, that's the challenge with the church today is that we're going for the lost, but we're not taking care of the people God's given us. And we need to not only find the lost, but we've got to keep you. We've got to feed you. We've got to take care of you. We've got to pray for you. We've got to encourage you. And yes, sometimes we've got to rebuke you. And when we rebuke you, don't run. Iron sharpens iron. God's building you up. God is making you into something you never thought you could be before. Come on and give him praise. This is how this thing's supposed to work. This is why we have three services on Sunday. Because we're not just reaching the lost. We're keeping the people God's given us. And I'm going to tell you, there's nothing more heartbreaking to me. And this is true. I, I just want to share my heart. Did you get something today? I, I want to share this last point with you. But I, I hope and pray that you wouldn't just put it on me. You would also take responsibility for it. Is there's no, nothing more heartbreaking than when people leave. When people leave. Or there's nothing more heartbreaking than when people quit the ministry. Especially people have been doing it a long time. And then they, they say, I'm burned out or I'm tired, or I'm used. Come on, somebody. There's nothing more heartbreaking than that. And I've seen people, I've been doing this a long time, 25 years. That's a long time, right? It's a quarter of 100 years. That's a quarter century. Woo, I'm getting old. And I've seen preachers come and preachers go. And I've seen music people come and go. And I've seen leaders come and go and I've seen people make big promises pastor I'm never going to leave I, you know, I'm going to be here till the hubcaps fall off and they never deliver on the promise and I'm going to tell you it's sad it's sad you say why are you bringing this out is that happening no but I just want to bring it out because it's sad marriages break up it's sad young people leave become disgruntled it's sad but 99% of the reason why it happens is because those people who leave stop growing. That's it. They stop growing. They stop reading the word. They stop loving the house of God, loving church, loving the presence of God. They let the enemy come in and steal, kill, and destroy. They lose something that was once precious within their life. They take the presence of God for granted. They, they, they no longer cherish the sweet anointing. The anointing that breaks the yoke of bondage. 
The anointing that sets the captive free. The anointing that gave us our joy. The anointing that gave us a power that, we, that alcohol could never give us. Drugs could never give us. They no longer cherish the power of God. When that dies, they begin to die. And don't you know that the Spirit of God is not on you? The Spirit of God is in you. For some of you to make it, you've got to start tapping in. Tapping back in to the Spirit of God in your life. Don't let nominal casual Christianity arrest you because it's all over this city I can go to church on Sunday and drink on Monday and I can go to this church and no one's going to judge me and I have a boyfriend that's totally lost but if you come here we're going to sharpen you we're going to tell you the truth because God doesn't want you to be stuck he's got a great plan for your life Don't let this casual, fake Christianity grab you. You know why? Because you're not fake. You're a real person with real issues and a real heart and a real spirit and a real soul with a real plan. And you're among some real people that if you begin to get a hold of God, God will tell you how to get to the next level. Are you hearing me right now? Are you hearing me right now? We've got to get a hold of God's plan. Get a hold of God's plan. Lift up your hands all over the place.